Good evening, class. My name is Pam Turner. I will be the moderator for this evening's class. And welcome to another lecture presented by the Tampa class. This is a school, not a church, and neither are we affiliated with any religious organization. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, in the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. The Tampa branch was established in 1996. At this time, I would like to introduce to you the president, Dr. Cynthia Smith, and the vice president, Dr. Latara Burley. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title of the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title of the Word or Son is Elohim. It has been improperly substituted by God. The name of the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God are titles, not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. That means Elohim is the title our creator chose for himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part in a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew, Greek, nor Latin languages have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a J in our own English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death, therefore making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings of the true and original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, he is incomprehensible and inscrutable. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape or form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son, a super incorporeal being that is having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine visions and understood in divine revelations. Later on, the self-same spirit manifested himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is what was the name of the Savior during the time he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title can be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in the school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of Egypt, he called Moses atop Mount Sinai, and he showed him the tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. The pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we show proof that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function 
of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. The 10 primary constitutional aims and objectives of the Institute are as follows. First is to help you find and know Yahweh, our Elohim, as he really is and actually exists. Second is to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth is to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. This evening we'll have class dedicated in prayer by Dr. Jennifer Marshall. And we will have um, our scripture read by Dr. Sherry Williams, which is Acts, the second chapter. And our readers this evening are Dr. Sherry Williams and Dr. Carol Miller. Let's all bow our hearts and minds and thank Yahweh for bringing us here again to learn more about him and that we should love him and that we should love each other and that we continue to come to class to learn as much as we can. And considering the condition of the world, we need to go to class and stay together and really be diligent in knowing him as he really is and actually exists. We thank Yahweh for everything. Let us all say hallelujah. 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 Okay, I'll be reading out of the Holy Name Bible, containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Trainer of the Scripture Research Association Incorporated. Acts, the second chapter. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, while they were all with one accord in one place, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and rested upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Emilites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and in Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in parts of Libya about Serene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful words, works of Elohim. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others, mocking, said, these men are full of new wine and are drunken. 
But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith Yahweh, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day of Yahweh come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. Ye men, sons of Israel, hear these words. Yahshua of Nazareth, a man approved of Yahweh among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which Yahweh did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of Yahweh ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom Yahweh hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I have set Yahweh always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in show, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption, thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thine countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that Yahweh had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Messiah to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of the Messiah, that his soul was not left in show, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Yahshua hath Yahweh raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of Yahweh exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, Yahweh said unto my Eloah, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that Yahweh hath made that same Yahshua, whom ye have crucified, both King and Messiah. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be immersed every one of you in the name of Yahshua the Messiah for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as Yahweh our Elohim shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this perverse generation. Then they that gladly received his word were immersed, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. 
And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their food with gladness and singleness of heart, praising Yahweh and having favor with all the people. And Yahweh added to the congregation daily, such as were being saved. That was Acts, the second chapter. Hallelujah. Good evening, brethren. Good evening. Our first speaker this evening would be Dr. Daryl Hughes. Hello, everybody. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and have a chance to share something about our great creator and savior. Uh, let's, let's go right to the scripture lesson. Start it right at one. Acts 2 and 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance. This is, and this is, this is our first account of Pentecost, uh, where the Holy Spirit is poured out. And uh, the world talks about the Holy Spirit, and they could read the scripture, and they know that there was this Pentecost, but they don't really understand it. Um, and they don't understand it well, they don't understand it at all. Uh, they don't understand what the Holy Spirit is. They talk about a trinity uh, when it's really a unity. Give me John 1 and 1. John 1 and 1. Oops. Go ahead. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Yahweh, and the Word was Yahweh. The so same... It says in the beginning was the word and the word was with Yahweh and the word was Yahweh. Um, go ahead. The same was in the beginning with Yahweh. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. And the light right. shot. Jump down to the... Um... 14. Yeah. 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. See, the world has a trinity. They talk about three persons, basically. Um, like they were three separate entities, see? But it, but it says right in John 1, 1, that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with Yahweh, and the word was Yahweh. See, it says he was Yahweh, and that the word was made flesh. Right in that scripture, it's telling you that they're all one. There's only one, see? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, these things are one. These three are one, see? And um, let's get now out. This is something that was foretold would happen. It talks about it right in the scripture. Where, where does he get into um, Joel? What is it? Joel. Uh, it's verse 16. And it's Joel 2 and 28. You don't have to get it uh, because he's actually quoting Joel here. This, these are, you can look up Joel 2, 2, 28, 32, and it says the same thing it says in 17 here. And Joel 2, 28, and 2, 28, it says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I shall pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. He's quoting word for word Joel here, see? Mm -hmm. And this is this is 
another example of how people don't understand how unified the scriptures are and that everything has to go by law, profit, fulfillment. It's all one, see, it's, it's, and it's one. Um, one Yahweh, and it's Yahweh Elohim and Yahshua is one. It's the same one. He, he transmutated, uh, he came, he stepped forth right within himself, as we say in the, in the moderation, that, that in his pure spirit state, you couldn't, you couldn't see him, you couldn't know him, you couldn't understand him in that pure spirit state. And him knowing that you couldn't, man couldn't perceive of him in that state, took on shape and form right within himself as Elohim, see? And this is the word of son, see? And then later on, manifested in a physical body as Yashu. And can we get the name, do you have the names chart? Yes. See, he manifested right within himself as Yahshua. And we well, we say it in the moderation um, that Yahshua is the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body, see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body. Yahshua is the Holy Spirit, see? Where is the scripture where he says that he has to go? 14 and about 16, maybe. Where is oh, four, it? 14 and 2. John 14 and 2. Oh, okay. Actually, start right at 1. John 14 and 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in Yahweh, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Right. And where I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas yeah. saith unto him, Master, we know not where thou goest, and how can we know the way? Yahshua saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Right. See, he he had to, he had to, um, the comforter, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit, see? And he said he'll be with us always. You can jump jump down uh to to 25. Oh, what do you want? What'd you say, Kathy? 15? 16. 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. See, and he's, you he's saying he, he, he dwelleth with you. See, at that time, he was physically with them. But he it says, and shall be in you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, he, he, and he had to, the, he said that he had to die in order for the Holy Spirit to come. And I can't remember where it said that, but I remember it said that somewhere. I don't know if anybody remembers. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. So, and he talked about, he kept talking about the Holy Spirit's going to come, um, that he'll be there. Uh, go to uh, John 7 and like 37. John 7 and 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Yahshua stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Keep going. But this spake he, of the spirit 
which they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because that Yahshua was not yet glorified. That's right. See, the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Yahshua had not been glorified. And, and I think it's important. I've heard people say that um, everybody has the Holy Spirit, but they just don't know it. But that's not what the book says. The book says that it says right here, um, but but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Yahshua was not yet glorified. See, Yahshua had to have his death, burial, and resurrection happen before the Holy Spirit could be poured out. See? Um, and the Holy Spirit is Yahshua. <laughs> We, we say they're the same thing, see? The, it is Yahshua, the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I think I want to... Uh, uh, let's get let's go back to the scripture lesson. And I want to... Want to uh, let's see. Um, let's start at about... Well, where'd we leave off? Actually, you could jump down jump past down. the jump down to uh start at third go jump down to 12 for me. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. See, they're laughing and mocking some people that were observing this, saying that basically they, they were drunk. Um, they've drunk wine because of the way that the things that they were saying. Now, it could be that you we could look at it that because, you know, they all spoke different languages and they were understanding each other. But also, if you think about it, the way that people um, perceive what we teach, people think we're crazy. You could say that they almost think that we might be drunk or crazy. <laughs> Because this is so different than everything else that's being taught, what we teach people. Mm -hmm. um, we teach people that um, I, it's, it's people truly think that you can't come to know Yahshua the way he really is and actually exists. Um, people think that, that uh, it's impossible to know him um, except by blind faith, see? And people, and people, if you teach outside of tradition, I've heard people say that if you don't, I don't know, I've heard some people say that there's people that define cults as not believing in, what, what is it? There's a couple of things that has to do with Christianity, basically. The Trinity, the resurrection of a physical body. And there's another one. It's, it, and people, and there's a, somebody that defines a cult as that, which basically puts everything as a cult if it's not Christianity and what Christianity teaches. And Christianity is wrong, but they're so steeped in it, the name, the Trinity, and all of these principles that, that to them, anybody who says anything else is crazy, which is basically what, a, what, what people think of in terms of a cult. Um, and, uh, the Holy Spirit is a powerful thing. And so when they quoted Joel, and I'm not going to read all those, but they talked about prophecies and, and doing all of these wonders. And then after they talked about that, towards the end of the scripture, it talks about all of the great things that people did um, in the name of Yahshua with the Holy Spirit. See, we have to have the Holy Spirit in us. And you could get that, uh, you could find that all over, all over, um, that you need to have the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and, uh, they talk about the immersion in here, um, and people and the church likes to think every time they hear emerge immersion, uh, that it's talking about water, but, um, give me, uh, give me, uh, Luke th three and 16. Luke three and 16. Hmm. <clears throat> John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. 
he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. See, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, um, oh, I just had a thought and I lost it. But he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It's not with water. We need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Um, and, oh, I know, I was thinking, somebody brought up in a classroom the other day that Yahshua never baptized anybody. And they talked about the, um, they were talking about uh, like they, how Yahshua instituted everything and like he instituted baptism, but he never baptized anybody. I think there was a scripture verse for that, but I don't remember. I don't remember who was teaching that. Was that Sarah that brought that up? <laughs> that Yahshua never baptized anybody. So he didn't even baptize anybody with water. I'll say it that way. Let me add those words. Uh, because when you're being baptized with the Holy Spirit, that's who you're, that, that is who you're being baptized with. Um, so um, anyways, I sort of, I, I have other things that I get on my mind, but I was trying to stay with the scripture. And uh, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I, I, the thing is, I guess the main thing for me is that the, the, this is, this is the beginning of it all. Oh, I mentioned the promise in the scripture. This is the promise. Can we get the carnal ordinances chart? Yes. This is the promise. This is the promise. You can see on the bottom, see, it shows the, uh, Abrahamic promise, uh, over the snake over the snake there towards the bottom. And then there's a uh, line coming down from Abrahamic promise going across and pointing to Pentecost, the Jews and the Gentiles, see? The promise was that that both the Jews and, and the other, all nations would be saved through, through him, through this promise, see? And that promise is where our salvation comes from, see? It doesn't come from us following the cardinal ordinances and getting them all right and then doing them and then we're saved, see? We know that that's not how you're saved. As a matter of fact, the book says that uh, the purpose of the law was to, to make sin exceedingly sinful, see? And it was to prove us. It was to show us who we were, that we weren't capable of that. And that salvation was coming through the promise of Abraham. And this Holy Spirit, which is the right side here, this new, this new covenant, is, is him, see? Dr. Kent... Dr. Kinley, well, I'm not going to get in there right now, but this, this is, this is, this is the Holy Spirit was the promise that Abraham made, and this is our salvation. Anyways, I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to turn it over to somebody else because I, I don't want to fumble too much with this topic because I don't feel like I have a lot more. But uh, all praise and glory go to Yahshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our next speaker will be Dr. Pamela Turner. Good evening, class. Good evening. Uh, yeah, this is, it's not the simplest topic, I would say. Um, but this is a really, um, it's a wonderful topic. And I agree with Daryl. I, I enjoyed his remarks immensely. And I agree that this isn't something that is readily understood by the church world. Um, and, you know, once you start to realize just how, how Yahweh has laid down his purpose, everything fits together. And I love how he brought out that, that the, you know, the scriptures, the law and the prophets and the fulfillment, I mean, this entire book, everything is, is unified. I mean, we know that there's mistranslations and errors, but in, in, you know, it's just a beautiful thing how right in Acts, you have that Joel um, scripture. It's just, it's mind blowing really when you start reading and throughout the, what's referred to as the New Testament, how so many times you have um, the Messiah himself referring to the scriptures and you have various, um, you know, you have the disciples or not the disciples, but I wanted to say the apostles referring to the scriptures and, you know, Stephen, his whole um, 
lecture that he runs down, you know, before he gets stoned and, you know, he's right in the book the whole time. And it seems, just seems like Christianity has completely missed this. And, you know, um, I was brought up in the Catholic church and they would read out of what they would call the gospels. And they would, it was it, the whole, the whole thing would consist of repetition of prayers, repetition of physical standing up, sitting down, doing the things with your hands, getting the wafer, getting the holy water, and then just this kind of methodical reading out of just this one section of the Bible. And then the priest would get up there and then he would talk about something that was kind of uh, I guess supposed to be inspirational, <laughs> but it never, nothing ever came across as actually trying to teach you something because what they really wanted to do is they wanted to keep you in darkness because they wanted to, it, as soon as you start having an education, then, you know, then you're going to start questioning and then their livelihood is at stake and them receiving money is at stake. So anytime somebody is receiving income from what's being preached, um, they just, they just want to keep the people subdued basically is what they wanted to do. And, um, some, some churches will use, um, they'll just use, um, smooth words and just, you know, kind of like self-help type of language and make you feel good about Jesus. And then some like the Catholic church pretty much uses guilt. <laughs> so, um, but this thing with Pentecost, I'll just add a couple things and then I'll leave it for the next uh, speaker. I can't get too deep into this, but um, I'll just make a few points about some a couple things that I do know. And um, if you go go back to that covenant chart and um, covenant. The cardinal ordinances. Or the cardinal ordinances. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you see on the right hand side, um, there's you see the heart, and then there's a little itty bitty um, below uh, to the left hand side. You see that woman, and she's in the sun, and then she has the moon under her feet, and that you know so we we know that that woman starting way back when um Yahweh he referred to the assembly as his bride you know he said that that, that he was a husband unto them and we know that there at Mount Sinai he spoke down that law and that Israel agreed to do what Yahweh said and that is likened to a marriage ceremony where, you know, when people are getting married, they say their I do. So yes, you know, Yahweh, we will do all that you said, all that you spoke down and we agree. So there's several examples of that where we have an example of, of his, his people as um, feminine. And we also refer to us just, you know, even now in the reality, just spiritually feminine, that Yahshua is our, our husband, we are the bride. And so in, in this Pentecost that, um, that we're reading here in the scripture reading that Daryl got into a bit, it's in, and, and he talked about how this is the promise. So isn't a marriage a promise? And so ultimately this is the reality and this is the state that we want to be in. We want to be in Yahshua. We are that bride and we want to be clothed in him. And that's likened to, you know, an immersion or a burial. Um, we're clothed in the, in the sun. Um, and it shows her symbolically, you know, as a, a woman there. And then you have the, the physical S-U-N, which we know is figurative of Yahshua, the S-O-N. And if you go over to where it's the, uh, the Moses chart. And on the Moses chart, there is a section that, so over on the right-hand side where it, it says Pentecost. And if you zoom in on that, and that's that, there's that woman clothed in the sun again there. And the moon is under her feet and that moon genders to those, that um, old covenant, the carnal ordinances. And so those are no longer in effect. And so this Pentecost, this is the bringing forth of that reality, that promise. 
because we're no longer in bondage and we're no longer um, in the state of in condition of condemnation. Um, Cynthia always loves to get that. There is therefore now no condemnation. And that it's Romans, the eighth chapter. Um, we don't have to get it though right now, but um, I want to see where I want to go as, of, as far as scriptures. Um, let's go to, um, I also like how it's talking about, um, it's talking about that they are, that there's cloven tongues of fire. So let's go over to where it talks about and I'm not sure where this is. If somebody could help me, that would be awesome. Where it talks about the um, being baptized. I think it's when um, being talked about how um, he that will come after me will baptize with fire. We just got that in John, wasn't it? Did we just get that? Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, so we already did get that. Okay, I'm so sorry. But it's okay. I mean, so everyone... what was that? We wanted it to get it again. No, that's okay. Um, so well, another thing about the fire is that, or not the fire, but it talks about the cloven tongues. And that's likened to, um, you know, we were just talking about how, how the scriptures are, everything is pointing to the reality. <laughs> And so the reason why the, the tongues were cloven is that that's, that means two, that's like a cloven hoof and everything, the law and the prophets, there's two, there's those two witnesses. And that's pointing to uh, that spiritual reality. So since we already got that, I don't know where my brain went during that. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's get where Yahshua talks about, um, oh gosh, I'm so bad with the scriptures, how we um, we are in Yahshua, um, he's in us and we're in him. John, I believe. Um, um, Isn't it John 17? Oh, you know what? It, it might be. Let me see. Round 20. I and them, thou and me. Oh, let me hang on. Let me see. 21. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. Okay, yeah. So that thou may be one in us. Yeah, 23, yeah, around there. Okay. okay. John 17 and 21. That they all may be one as thou, Father, are in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Mm -hmm. So that I'm, I'm just, I'll interrupt a little bit. So, you know, we talk about how a marriage is uh, that, that they're one flesh. Right. And, and there's a joining that happens. There's so many principles in that. And, and, and I loved how Daryl was talking about, um, you know, it's so beautiful to actually just start out with that unity of the spirit, because, you know, our soul does have to go through a conversion because when you're carnally minded, you cannot be one with the spirit. And, and it, it's just like, you can't, we talk about all the time, you know, like no, the first name, you know, to help you find and know Yahweh as he really is and actually exists. And it's that, it's that intimacy. It's that knowing we talk about to, um, eternal life is to know. And in a marriage, when you become one and you know each other intimately, and this is kind of, these are all, we have to learn from these spiritual or these physical uh, manifestations to understand that uh, that spiritual principle so keep, keep going here that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me 
and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. Mm -hmm. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Mm -hmm. Father, I will. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And right. yep. I found a verse that, that says exactly what you said. Okay. I and them, them and me. Um, it's John 14. And... Oh, just had it. <laughs> Is it 11? Uh, Believe me that I am no. in the Father and the Father in me. No, it's 20. John 14, 20. Oh, okay, sure. We can go over there. At that day, you shall know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. Right, right. That's that's beautiful. So really, you know, that that just that just made me think of when you're talking about a woman clothed in the sun. We are that's us in Yahshua. And this goes all the way back to um, you have Adam and Eve in the garden. And we know that that woman was in the man to begin with and that she was brought out of the man. And, and the, the, the culmination of everything is that that woman has to be put back in the man. And we see as a type that Adam, he, as a type of Yahshua, willingly died for his bride. And it's, it's just so beautiful. You know, when you see that type that he willingly died for his bride. And that to me shows that that husband and that bride scenario. I'm trying to think of what else I think. I don't really know if I have all that much more. Um, I know that was really short, but I really appreciate the opportunity to have something to say about Yahshua. So I don't want to kind of just spin my wheels. So I'm going to go ahead and let someone else have a shot. Thank you for the time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Our next speaker will be the vice president of the Tampa class, Dr. Latour Burley. Okay. Well, good evening. And um, good evening. I definitely enjoyed the remarks of both speakers. And um, I'll try to see if I can um, add a little bit of light and pick up where they left off. Um, it's definitely an honor and a pleasure to have anything to say about our Heavenly Father, Yahweh. And um, it is definitely important that we get together, like the prayer um, was mentioned, and that we learn something about our Father and, um, you know, us, us learning these things is is what we are coming together for, you know, and, and it's the brethren, it's the, you know, communing, it is, you know, us learning from each other through, you know, the Holy Spirit and letting Yahshua just guide us, you know, so that we can be um, illuminated in our understanding. Now, I wanted to pick up um, and John, where um, actually we can start even here. It talks about um, just being, you know, baptized in that name and how, um, you know, they were talking about a lot of people don't know what that is. And, um, you know, Pam just talked about that the spiritual reality. She went over that, how um, in that covenant chart, you see that woman um, being clothed in the sun. And that's, that's the spiritual reality of baptism. You know, there there is a, a physical manifestation and we can all the way go back, you know, on the law, how, um, you know, the children of Israel, 
they were baptized in principle through, um, you know, the divided waters of the Red Sea and how, um, you know, previous people mentioned that Yahshua, you know, never baptized and that uh, John did, but he, it was a, you know, principle and it was a shadow of, you know, things that was going to come and you know we are that woman we are that bride and that baptism you know back there was setting it up you know that woman because Israel was that bride like you know Pam had uh, mentioned and so see that bride being um you know baptized you know through that water the Red Sea and Joshua who was Joshua led them and so when I love, I love the spiritual reality of things because people don't understand. We go through the law and the prophets. We go through these things all the time, but it's the, when, once you get the reality of, you know, wow, that was what it was talking about. That was the purpose of that. That was Joshua fulfilling that. And so I'm glad that she brought that out because people really don't understand that spiritual reality of baptism. And it, you know, are completely covered, but it's being covered by, you know, our husband with Joshua and it's in the name. So I want you to pick up, um, get set the scripture reading at um, 36 verse. And um, yeah, and in Acts, there's so much in here. And then um, go and get John, I believe. It talks about um, the baptism. So just start here in Acts first. Acts 2 and 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that Yahweh hath made that same Yahshua, whom ye have crucified, both King and Messiah, now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Mm -hmm. And I'm then, gonna interrupt in between, so I apologize ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name mm -hmm. of Yahshua the Messiah. See, now it says be baptized every one of you but it says in the name see when we think about you know being baptized it's just like a being covered being fully submerged but it's not talking about water again you know we've been so conditioned prior to well, I, I speak for myself even prior to coming to class that anytime you think of baptism you're thinking of water and we never even knew to question really what baptism was or, or why did it have to be water we just didn't even know that we didn't know mm -hmm. <laughs> so but it says here being baptized in the name of Yahshua the Messiah and it, and keep going here um <clears throat> Be okay. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Yahshua the Messiah for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It says, So you shall receive the remission of sins, and then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And keep going there because I don't want to jump ahead. <laughs> for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as Yahweh, our Elohim, shall call. So this is like for generations to come. So this is this is not like, this, Yahshua is really, he fulfilled and, you know, he promised, you know, that once he raised up off that cross and he poured out his Holy Spirit, it was that gift of eternal life and it was to everyone who the father has given him everyone that believe it on the name um keep going mm -hmm. and with many other words 
did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward were untoward word generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And it was it was just that simple. They then that gladly received the word of his testimony, they, they were baptized that day. Now go and get over in John, um, the first chapter. John 1 and 26. John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. Is that what you want? Yeah. He it is who's coming after me is preferred before me. Mm -hmm. so, so now he's saying, John here is saying that he baptized, but he says with water. Mm -hmm. See, and then the other scripture read that he's going to baptize. Wow, well, is it here? 20, we'll talk about 30. Yeah, 38. Yeah, yeah, but I'm, just keep reading here. And John, mm -hmm. okay, 27. He it is who's coming after me is preferred before me. Okay, let me go to 26. John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. Mm -hmm. He it is who's coming after me is preferred before me. Mm -hmm. So he came before him, but he's coming after him. and and. There's so much. Mm -hmm. We're talking about Yahweh being pure spirit <laughs> way in the beginning before time ever was. See, he planned all this out, his will, you know, and it talks about even beginning here in the scripture lesson and how that word Yahweh manifested himself in a physical body. Then also when he manifested himself, he walked this earth plane. He set up everything. He stepped into that body. He was stepping in and out of bodies, you know, all throughout the law and the prophets, but it wasn't permanent. That perfect, perfectly made body that was set up for the creator, because it had to be perfect, because you're talking about the creator of the universe, stepping inside of a physical body, no spot, no blemish, as Joshua the Messiah, setting up baptism back there with the children of Israel, then having John here saying that, okay, John, you're going to baptize with water. Why? Because it was physical. It was, it, it, he, he is setting up something. So John had to um, be the one to immerse those uh, Jews when they came to him and asked them, well, he, when he asked them, have they sent? And they said, yes. And so John is going to baptize them. And now he's saying, now he, read that part um, mm -hmm. here, who refer, is preferred before me. Uh, 27, John 1 and 27. He mm -hmm. it is who's coming after me is preferred before me. Right, read. Whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. Mm -hmm. And These, so, I'm sorry, I keep going. These things were done in Bethabara, Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. Mm -hmm. The next day, John seeth Yahshua coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of Yahweh, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man, which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Okay, and I get for me that scripture when it talks about that spiritual rock. Uh, I believe it That's is Romans, I believe the tenth first Corinthians 10 4. First, okay. Thank you. Yeah, first Corinthians 10 and 4. First Corinthians 10 and 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that that led them and that rock was the messiah i think you got to pick it up um uh, let me see. one let's yeah, pick it up. One. yeah moreover brethren i would not 
that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Mm -hmm. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that led them. And that rock was the Messiah. Right. So it says, you so they were baptized again back there because people like you know where was baptism back there in the law but it's it was a um spiritual principle that they were baptized unto moses again but, but remember moses couldn't let them over into that promised land so he couldn't been the one that was is going to make them clean or give them that land so they were baptized unto moses see but but it says that here that um, they drank of that spiritual rock that led them. See, <laughs> Yahshua is that spiritual rock that led them up into that land because Moses couldn't do it. And then over here in John is the same. John also baptized them. See, couldn't give them eternal life. Again, is is Yahshua setting it up that a man, a physical man with these physical you know, things could not give you eternal life. You can't be saved being dunked in water. You see, because they couldn't, Moses couldn't save them. He had to step back and Joshua, who was really, was Joshua had to let them, lead them over. And it says, you know, they let them. And so here's the same principle, you know, is right from the beginning, it set it up and then he's fulfilling it at the end. See, Joshua, and they taught, it's John 17 and three. See, he is, eternal life he is the one that's going to um baptize you with fire with you know um get get for me that scripture where it talks about um well did we just read that I, yeah that was in i believe matthew Luke. 3 11 he will baptize you with the holy spirit and fire yeah is if, that if, what you want yeah Matthew 3.11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Be with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And don't you want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? Yes. Don't you, be, you don't want to be baptized with just water because guess what? The water's polluted. And it's like you put in a dirty, simple body in dirty water because the water is not clean, you know. So a physical uh, thing could not make you make you clean. It can't clean up your inside. You know, you got to clean up the inside of that cup first. And you're talking about baptizing you and, and cleaning up your 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 soul with water. No. Joshua is going to clean you up and he, he's going to baptize you and give you that Holy Spirit. And um, also when, when um, you know, Daryl was talking about Yahweh, you know, being pure spirit, let's get for me that chart. Um, get for me the Moses chart. Well, it's already here. Open up this really quick. So, it, you know, it's, it's so beautiful because it's like he, Oops, he, sorry. Up. he's the one that is coming down he's the one is get for me um just 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 go to john one and one there's so much in here so we're just going to stay there john one and one in the beginning was the word and the word was with yahweh and the word was yahweh the same was in the beginning with yahweh mm -hmm. all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made and so I'm gonna I'm gonna read also because I was I was reading um in the Elohim book and I just wanna um read this part if if anybody wanna get it. It is um the third volume and it's the same thing here we're talking about. Um and it's on page four. And it says Yahweh himself is spirit. And so that's what we see right here on this chart. It says Yahweh is spirit. And then it has the spiritual attributes, you know, here. And it says in this state, he is inconceivable, incompre incomprehensible, inscrutable, invisible. 
and get for me the definition of corpse and get for me the definition of um, incorporeal. What was the first one? Corpse. Corpse. Hmm? Like a core, okay. I'll look up in corporeal. Okay. Because you're talking about, well, I'm, what, I'm, what I want to show you, you're talking about something physical versus something spiritual. Because prior to us coming into class, we did not know anything that was spiritual. Only thing we had was to look at was the flesh. And we thought the flesh was it. We thought the, the, the flesh was, was everything and that was, that was it. There was nothing else beyond the flesh that we could see. Corpse, a dead body, especially of a human being rather than an animal. Do you want more? Yeah, does it has a... Uh... Okay, archaic, it says corpse, a human, now this says actually a human or animal body, whether corpse, whether living or dead, a dead body, especially of a human being, remains of something. Okay, uh, so, so we pretty much know what that is. Okay, a dead body like a human being, I get for me corporeal. Corporeal is not composed of matter, having no material existence. Then it says law having no physical existence. Right. Not having, not having no physical existence. Right. Is there, is there anything else there? No. Not on... Uh, okay. So when you look at when you look at a, a when you're talking about a corpse when you're talking about something that's physical is 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 dead there's 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 nothing there you know what I mean and then we talk when you look at here and it says one of the attributes is he is um he's inscrutable he's inconceivable and this is uh Yahweh Elohim is incorporeal now get for me the definition of um where is it um. Uh, think is corporeal. Yeah, corporeal. This is body. Corporeal, <laughs> having, oh. consisting of, or relating to a physical material body, such as not spiritual. So, not spiritual, um, not immaterial or intangible. Okay, cool. So is the, mm -hmm. yeah, not not spiritual. Yeah, did you say it's yeah, opposed to spirit? Go go ahead. Oh no, I think Sherry. I wasn't sure if she said uh, as opposed especially as opposed to their spirit, relating to a person's body, especially as opposed to their spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you have Yahweh Elohim in this pure spirit state, right? So he is inconceivable and inscrutable, right? And then you have uh, what, what Yahweh being in pure spirit and then manifesting himself in that physical body um, as Joshua and Messiah, it's the difference between that physical manifestation versus that spiritual manifestation, but we can't understand that with our physical eyes. So he has to give us things to understand. So when you read uh, here in the Elohim book, can you just pick it up at the last section here where it talks about Yahweh himself in spirit and just Pick it up from there, and then I'll just interject here. Volume three, page what? Four. Okay, volume three, page four. All right. At the bottom of the page, you're saying? Mm hmm Okay. Let us witness. 
No, where it says Yahweh himself. Okay. <clears throat> so this is, yes. Ta the, the heading is tabernacle pattern compared to the physical body. Mm -hmm. Volume three, page four. Yahweh himself is spirit, John 4, 24. And in this state, he is inconceivable, incomprehensible, inscrutable, and invisible. Everything abides in Yahweh or pure spirit. There is nothing coexistent or co-eternal with it. It is the source and substance, the limits and the bounds of everything, both invisible and visible. Mm -hmm. This pure spirit state of Yahweh can be likened unto a cloud which has no conceivable shape or form. And in this spirit is encrouched the attributes of intelligence, wisdom, knowledge, beauty, love, justice, foundation, or power, foundation, and strength. Okay, He's now let's start right there. And so it said, so th this remind me of um, the scripture where Yahweh says that, uh, well, in the beginning, he told Moses, you know, that he has seen the children of Israel, you know, affect, uh, in their affliction, that he said, I am come down. Mm -hmm. See, and so here it says, you know, Yahweh is, is in like a cloud and we can't perceive that. So this spiritual um, being here is coming out of that pure spirit state in, a, in this physical form so that we, you know, being you know, physical beings, that's the only thing that we can understand is something, you know, that we can touch and see is like he is breaking himself all the way down to his creation so that we can understand him and his uh, manner or his likeness. And then it says here, you know, how he is the source and substance, limits and bounds of everything. So we can't put, you know, limits on Yahweh. We can't put Yahweh in a box, you know, like, like, you know, Daryl was talking about that guy that he's not three different entities. He's one spirit, you know, breaking himself down in a, in a visible shape and form. And um, keep going here. These attributes become united together in a conceivable shape and form, which Moses viewed as the great Elohim. Now we can conceive him. See, he says mm -hmm. conceivable. And I, I hope I hope I'm trying to like put this together so it can make sense. But it's like when I was reading this, it was just so much in this one little section, but it's so powerful because now, you know, these attributes that we we look at, you know, beauty, love, justice, power, foundation, and strength, we can conceive the creator of the universe coming into this shape and form that we see here on this chart, which says, which Moses, because he was the first one who even Yahweh showed him, you know what I mean? It's like, he's the first one. So now because of what Moses saw in his vision, we are able to understand we are recipients of that we are coming down here in this later day and time understanding and being able to conceive what he showed to moses way back there in the law of this great elohim um keep going because i'm gonna get excited <laughs> this elohim then was pure spirit yahweh in shape and form abiding within still as yet unformed spirit See what that says it says abiding within still as yet it was unformed spirit we cannot understand what unformed spirit is it was not in shape and form and some people say Yahweh was always in shape and form no he's not we just read it here mm -hmm. he had to come into shape and form and that's even you know talking about breaking himself down and that lamb slain from the foundation of the world that's that is that is like until, uh, um, you know, it, it, it had to be like breaking that pure spirit down. You know, you, you're talking about a, a Adam or, you know, it didn't take all of Yahweh 
to create his creation. It's just like, you know, us, when we have children, it doesn't take all of us to create our children. So it's not going to take all of Yahweh to create his creation. But keep going. It did not take all of the pure spirit to form the super incorporeal form of Elohim. Then Elohim creates the physical man, Adam, in his likeness and image. And some 4,000 years later, Elohim himself is manifested in a physical body and walked around in the universe that he had created. So Yahweh, and we, we go over this all the time, Yahweh created Adam, man, in his likeness, it was like Yahweh formulated, you know, this purpose, pattern, and plan spoke into it in existence, took that same word, came into shape and form, made the man, they were fruitful and multiplied. Then he also still took his spirit, create, created a fleshly body, stepped inside that body. <laughs> walked the earth plane, died, buried, did all these miracles, told the prophets to write down everything what they saw, you know, in the in, in the book we in or you know in the tablet scriptures, whatever they had, died, buried, resurrect, took his spirit, poured it out again on the day of Pentecost, and now we are here receiving what Yahweh purpose way back then before the creation of the world and i'm just i'm i'm just so awed at that because it is like it is so beautiful to know that our creator like we are here receiving what was done before we were even born mm -hmm. and, and he talks about you know that um get well keep going keep reading here and then let's get that scripture um first timothy 3 and 16. Mm -hmm. And hopefully this, I can wrap it up. This transmutation of pure spirit without shape and form into a super incorporeal shape and form and then into a physical form sets up a pattern that the whole universe testifies of and confirms. Mm -hmm. Super incorporeal form. See, and, it's, and he didn't just you know, take himself, it says that Yahweh transmutation, it was this transmutation, he mutated himself of the pure spirit without shape and form. So he's continuing to create, he's continuing to, you know, go on, but it doesn't take all of Yahweh to do this. And this is, this is all of the, you know, the attributes that we see, this is how much power and wisdom and intelligence that Yahweh has. And, you know, we see it through all this creation, you know, everything in the universe is testifying of it. And it's confirming that what we're doing down here today, which is, you know, that John 17 and um, one, you know, is eternal life is for us to know these things and to receive it. It talks about it in scripture reading, you know, that we believe that we receive that Holy Spirit. And so get um, first Timothy three and 16. Let me pick it up at 15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of Yahweh, which is the assembly of the living Elohim, the pillar and ground of the truth, and without controversy, great is the mystery of holiness. He who is manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, mm -hmm. king of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Mm-hmm. And so get um also uh John 3 16. It's the same thing, but yeah, get John 3 and 16. John 3 and 16. For Yahweh so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it's Yahweh says that he gave his only begotten son, but it was really Yahweh himself. 
-hmm. is Yahweh. Yeah, it's, it's Joshua. These three are one. It's him himself because his only begotten son is Yahshua, but the name is Yahweh's is salvation. Yahweh gave himself for the whole world. Yahweh gave himself up to us, you know, and broke that, that body down, you know, so that we can be down here receiving, being recipients and receiving that Holy Spirit. So I just thought that it was, um, you know, beautiful because, um, you know, Daryl was talking about how Yahweh is pure spirit, you know, and we got, you know, in John, how, you know, y'all just the baptism and, you know, that word was made flesh. And I love going over these things over and over because it's like we, we skip over a lot of these things, but just going and reading and understanding what these words mean, what, you know, inconceivable, incomprehensible and inscrutable. We go over in the, in a moderation, but do we really understand what the creator of the universe did, what Yahweh truly did so that we can have eternal life. And I think it'll just be a greater appreciation for this teaching and for this class if we can just comprehend that. So, um, and it's so much more, I know other people can probably go into much more detail, you know, about this thing, but I'm just, you know, very grateful that I can understand a little bit about this. And, um, you know, have a lot of appreciation for this class. So um, I'll yield the floor and thank you. And uh, all praises and honor and glory goes to Yahweh through Yahshua. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our next speaker will be Dr. Charles Marshall. Okay. Uh... <clears throat> it's been a very good class so far, really. People are bringing out a lot of very good things. Uh, I don't know what I can add too much, but uh, we'll give it a stab anyhow. Uh, as we know, uh, coming down to these lectures and, and attending these classes, that everything that Yahshua does and everything that happened was uh, fulfillment when he was walking the Palestinian hills, he was fulfilling scripture. And it's just like uh, Daryl pointed out that part of this scripture here comes right from Joel. So it's, it's you know, and it's all showing forth, but yet here we take it for granted and we just, you know, we, we you know, because we're, it's just so much a part of us. It's just so ingrained in us that everything before he came, he was, was being instituted or set up. And then he came in and he, and he fulfilled what was written about him. And that's the reason why we know he was the Messiah. Now, on the day of Pentecost, I'm not, Sherry, I'm not going to have you read all those names again. <laughs> okay. because, because, oh my gosh. But look at all the, the countries that was listed there of people that were listening uh, to the Holy Spirit or being, you know, talking to, by, from, by the Holy Spirit in those men, in those disciples, and they were speaking, they were uh, speaking in tongues, if you will, because everyone could understand them. Now, this is like in fulfillment of the Tower of Babel. Because the Tower of Babel, he confused the tongues because uh, man's thoughts and, and everything and his whole thing. Uh, well, Nimrod showing forth the mystery of iniquity was, if you will, back in that time, back in, in Babylon, was actually inst uh, setting up or instituting himself. He was instituting the religions that you see in the world today. And what Yahweh did is he confused their tongues, but they went about with, with in different languages and, uh, and the gods that were set up back there were carried over into all these lands. So Yahweh confused those languages so that they could not understand. But at the day of Pentecost, he opened up our understanding. He's opened up our, you know, uh, knowledge of him. 
And so it's it's uh, it's just it's it's great. It's fantastic because we can see that and we can understand that. But yet a lot of times when it's pointed out to people in the world, they just can't understand it. See, their tongue is still confused. It takes the Holy Spirit to interpret tongues. It's just like when I was a child and I would go with my grandmother to the Apostolic Pentecostal Church. They would get up and they would speak what, what they claimed and what they said was speaking in tongues. And it, it was nothing but garbly gook is all it was, you know, and then somebody would say, something, well, it means this or it means that or whatever. Yes, they didn't have any understanding. But Yahweh, you see, on the day of Pentecost, he's been speaking to the world and he was speaking to us before we came into class. And then when we come into class, we understand that language. He has given us the Holy Spirit. It's the same with us. Now we understand, you know, and what Yahweh is doing is he's speaking Yahweh tongue, if you will. You see, Yahshua tongue. And we understand that tongue because we are his children. We are his offspring. So it's just so fantastic to see and hear that. Also, what he's doing, there's fulfillment of being sp of, of Yahweh back at Mount Sinai. See, speaking in the law to the children of Israel. He brought them up. To the, he brought them. He said that when he was going to, I, you can get it if you can find it, if you know where it's at, where he said that he, he brought them. Uh, he brought them out to worship him at the Mount. He brought them out of Egypt. Uh, out of the slavery, out of the bondage. And it's the same thing he's doing with us is that he's bringing us out of Egypt or he's bringing us out of darkness. Now, on the bottom of the chart there, you see that black and that black represents Egypt as in darkness or ignorance. They did not know Yahweh. You see, they had never heard that name Yahweh before. They knew that their forefathers had worshiped this God if you will, you see, by the name of El Shaddai, but they had never heard this name Yahweh, nor did they really know anything about him. So when he brought them up to the mount and he spoke in that Ten Commandment law, that was, that was a type of Pentecost, if you will, or uh, op trying to open up their understanding. But of course, at the time, it's just to show you and me and mankind that we cannot understand what Yahweh is saying unless he opens up our heart and our mind. Because the children of Israel back there, he spoke in those commandments and he spoke in the laws, but they did not understand. They had no idea what he was talking about. They had no idea of anything. And that's the reason why they rebelled. And we would be the same way we were the same way before we come into class. We're sitting there, we're dumb, we're ignorant. Some of us went to a church and some of us thought we knew a little something and some of us knew we didn't know a little something and, and some people didn't care and some people, you know, would, was going to church and, and, you know, trying to halfway be, you know, decent and all that. But then you come into class and Yahweh opens up your understanding and you realize that you knew nothing. Just like the children of Israel back there rebelled continuously against Yahweh. And it was to show us that without the Holy Spirit, we would be no better than them. And without the Holy Spirit, we're no better than the world out here. We're the same as. And sometimes we still act like that. You know, because we are still going through growth. We are still being changed. You know, we, some of us have been in class for a long time and we think we're grow up, grown up adults and that we really know something and we really don't know nothing yet. Because I'm going to tell you something. The more Yahweh opens up to me, the more understanding that I have, the more I realize I don't know. And it's, but it's a wonderful feeling, <laughs> I tell you, you know, just listening to Yahweh speaking to us, 
you see, going to these classes and listening to the different speakers with the Holy Spirit, reinforcing, lifting up your arms, giving you strength and, and, and understanding, you see, in the law and in the prophets, just like back there with Moses, when, Mo, when they were going over to conquer Canaan's land. Now, that's what we're doing now, you see. We're in, going into, into Canaan's land. We're going to be going from this physical into the spiritual. But Yahweh is opening up our understanding and giving us a taste of it now. Just like on the, on the, on the one side of Jordan, two tribes, they got their inheritance on that side of the, uh, 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 on this side of Jordan, if you will. But the other tribe, and they, the two tribes, had to go through the, uh, the wa departed waters of the Jordan River into Canaan's land, and they had to go in with the other 10 tribes. You see, oh, that's a, that's a nice chart. They had to go over with the other 10 tribes, you see, to fight for Canaan's land. And that's what we're doing now. We are in a fight for Canaan's land. We are in a fight, you see, to understand, to get more knowledge, to get more understanding. Our warfare is not carnal. We're not interested in going out here and picking up arms and, uh, and forcing people to believe what we believe. Nothing, nothing like that whatsoever. You see, our warfare is not physical. Our warfare is spiritual. And it's the words that we speak, just like the words that we heard, the words that we hear from Yahweh, just like the children of Israel back there at the Mount Sinai, they heard the words of Yahweh. But it scared, as, as, as we say, it scared the bejesus out of them. You see, they were scared to death. They were shaken. And they said, Moses, you go up, you talk to him. We don't want to, we, we don't want to hear that again. It was thunder. It was lightning. The ground was shaking. Well, I tell you something, and a lot of you can testify to this, that when you come to class, especially, boy, sometimes when I first came to class, you, my ground was shaken up. The things that I thought I knew was shaken up. The things that I knew that I didn't know were shaken up. It was thunder. It was lightning. And the ground, and my ground was shaking, you see. And, but Yahweh opened up our eyes. But what, unlike the children of Israel, see, we didn't have fear. We accepted it. We believed it. We, Yahweh put his spirit in us. He gave us the words, then he gave us the understanding, he gave us the ears to hear, and he didn't do that to the children of Israel back there. So we look at the children of history, uh, uh, the history of the children of Israel, and we see that they were disobedient continuously. That's because he did not give them the Holy Spirit. But today, after Pentecost, what is talking about here in, in uh, the ch second chapter, you see, them getting that, that revelation, getting that understanding, and the people thought they were drunk. The people thought that they were just, just yeah, they thought they were drunk because they were jumping up, probably jumping up and down and, you know, and just and walking around with a big old happy grin on their face and just it, it, it is exciting when you hear this gospel and it raises your consciousness. You see, it's exciting. And sometimes, you know, people might think we're drunk. I know people think we're crazy as a loon. You see, they, we, they, they think we're in an, we, they think we're in a cult. And some people even think we're in a occult. And they think that when we go around and we talk about this Yahweh, you know, oh, that's just, the, the, the people are crazy. So it, the things haven't really changed a whole lot. Things hasn't really, you know, uh, uh, it's still the same process going on. It's just that we're in a different age. And now Yahweh is readily pouring out his spirit. Whereas before, you see, back at Mount Sinai, he didn't. So there's a lot of fulfillment going on here. There's a lot of things going on. I hope I added a couple of things and uh, 
I'm going to leave time for another speaker because uh, it's it's good to hear everyone and it's good to hear the things that people get out of this because this is the reason why we come to class, you see, is to know and to understand Yahweh and to add to the things that we know about him so that we can better glorify him and by better glorifying him by being a good Yashuan and being a good Yashuan to each other and being a good Yashuan to ourselves. And with that, I'll uh, turn the floor over and thank you for the privilege uh, and the honor to speak something about Yahweh and his plan and purpose. Hallelujah. Our next speaker will be Dr. Kathy Humes. Wow. Um, it's an honor to have anything to say about Yahshua and his great Yahweh through Yahshua and his great purpose, pattern, and plan. I have thoroughly enjoyed all the speakers. It's just been loaded. This The class has been loaded with things. Um, I can just add a few things to it and carry on the baton. I'd like to go to um, Acts, the 18th chapter. And this is kind of dealing with us just like it was at the beginning of this age. We're down here at the end of this age and we're preaching the same gospel that Yahweh Elohim gave to Dr. Kinley to give to the world. We're preaching the gospel that the apostles preached, law prophets that Yahshua preached to fulfill. And if you could read that, Acts 18, start at, let me see, go there, go fast. Acts 18, 24. Acts you know, 18. Before you read that, I just want to make a point that before we came to this school, we were spiritually dead. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And the carnal mind can never please Yahweh, like it was already brought out. We can't know Yahweh with a carnal mind. We can't truly have a revelation of the creator with a carnal mind. We must receive the Holy Spirit to see spiritual things. And the creator prepares us throughout our whole lives. And then when we come to class, he's preparing us and he's preaching the gospel to us and cl cleansing us by his spirit. He actually gives us the Holy Spirit and he cleans us from the inside out. And that causes us to be resurrected in his image and to speak the same tongue. That was a nice point. You know, the creator speaks in a heavenly tongue. It's he's speaking in spiritual realities. And if you have a carnal mind, you can't understand anything about him. But at Pentecost, when he gives us the Holy Spirit, we're his kids. Of course, we're going to understand our parent talking to us, just like our kids understand us because we taught them our language. You know, that's the same thing that goes with Yahweh and his purpose spiritually. Okay, and if we could also go back to, um, I just wanted to bring up, uh, go ahead and start at 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. Now listen, he's mighty in the scriptures. This guy's a good teacher. Go ahead came to Ephesus, this man was instructed in the way of Yahweh, and being reverted in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of, the, of Yahweh, knowing only the baptism of John. This guy knew only the physical side of it. Apollos, he's preaching about Yahshua, law, prophets, and fulfillment, but all he can see is to the cross. He, he really doesn't understand what Yahshua was doing. Keep, keep going. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him 
the way of Elohim more perfectly. Mm -hmm. Okay, now read 28. For he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly showed by the scriptures that Yahshua was the Messiah. Now, Apollos at Ephesus showed by the scriptures that Yahshua was the Messiah, but there was something missing. Think about what, what was missing. Now read Exit, or, uh, Acts 19. And it came to pass that a while Apollos was at Corinth, all having passed through the upper coast came unto Ephesus and finding certain disciples. He said unto them, have ye received the Holy Spirit since ye believe? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be an Holy Spirit. See, we don't want that to happen in our classes. We want to keep the vision and revelation given from Yahweh through Dr. Kinley straight. We don't want to be straying from it. And the, the problem with Apollos is he didn't realize that there was a change in the covenants. He couldn't bring out Yahshua in you. Like all the speakers have so perfectly worked toward this, that Yahweh masterminded a purpose and he carried it out. And the ultimate end of the purpose or the ultimate crux of the purpose is to save those that he chose, save their souls so that they can go on into ages to come, learning and being one with the creator in righteousness, peace and joy and in, in glory and where there's no iniquity. See, we have to make sure when we preach this gospel to bring it over past the cross, to take it to Pentecost. That's why in Acts, the second chapter, it was so, that's why Acts is so exciting. They received the Holy Spirit. And like uh, Chuck was bringing out, there was people in from all over the world because the Jews had been scattered and Yahweh brought them back for the year of Jubilee. And Pentecost happened on June 6th. And they started preaching, see, with the Holy Spirit. They were anointed with that Holy Spirit to preach the gospel. And it says, uh, I, I, you can run the line on that. If you, can I have the elementary? Well, first I'll get Moses. Moses was anointed by the creator to preach the gospel, to go down there and deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt, to save their souls. All of Noah, I'll use Noah right here. Here's the boat down here at the bottom of the chart. Noah, he was anointed with a vision to preach. And to be true about that, in 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, holy men of Yahweh spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. When Yahweh took on shape and form and set up this purpose to show righteous principles, he actually put some of his spirit right in those vessels to carry it out at that time. They didn't understand the reality like we do. They just understood what Yahweh wanted them to do at that time. But the Holy Spirit was in them carrying out Yahweh's purpose. And it's all cumulative to show us that Yahshua the, is the Messiah. By the law, the prophets, by that pattern, see Yahshua fulfill. And take the whole creation and see that there's a creator and a savior. But it's not good enough to take it just there. We can't leave him on the cross. See, the Roman Catholic Church has a cross. They wear a cross around their neck, and it's called a crucifix. And it has the body of Yahshua on the cross. And they wear it around their necks, which is just a witness that they, they don't really understand that the Holy Spirit has come back, is risen, has been poured out. He's here. Yahweh took on shape and form and manifested in the flesh, but don't leave it there. He's got to manifest in you. 
That's what this was all about in Acts, the second chapter. The reality of the purpose. The Yahweh masterminded. I know what Tara was bringing this up. The Yahweh masterminded way back from the beginning. It's culminated at Pentecost. See, there's 4,000 years of death and darkness from Adam all the way on down to Yahshua because Adam and Eve sinned in the garden because Satan deceived Eve and Adam loved his bride enough to die for her. And, and, <laughs> you just, okay. Did you, I'm sorry. That, that's okay. Um, you want elementary? Um, Moses. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll just take it right here. I'll take it right here. There's from the transgression, Adam dies for his bride and they both get kicked out of the garden. See, that's a death and they're buried in Satan's kingdom now and they resurrect. But that's not what I want to show you right here and now. I want to show you that anybody that Yahshua sends to preach, he anoints them to preach the gospel. Noah was anointed to preach the gospel. That Holy Spirit had to get in him and move him. Second Peter 121, they were moved with the Holy Spirit. See, Moses, he had to have the Holy Spirit to go down. He had to be anointed with the Spirit to go down and preach. Now, could I have the body tabernacle? Mm -hmm. Okay. The priest here, the priesthood had to have a sacrifice offered for him and have blood put on his right ear, his right thumb, and his right toe. He had to be washed. Or there, there's a principle of a sacrifice, a death. And that priest had to be washed before he entered into his high priest ministry. But after he was washed, he had to be anointed to minister. See? That's what resurrected him up. He had to be anointed to minister. And if you go back to the Moses chart, I'll show you Israel is like a son of Yahweh. See, Yahweh anointed Israel in that cloud. See, they were in a death-like state, but through the preaching of Moses, the gospel of Yahweh through Moses, who was anointed with the spirit, they found out how to take out that lamb and put the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and eat the lamb, see? And uh, the plagues were poured out on Pharaoh and Israel resurrects into the wilderness, see? But you see anybody that's sent to preach the gospel, they got to be anointed to do it. And all through the prophets, all the prophets were given the Holy Spirit temporarily to preach the gospel to Israel. And Yahshua the Messiah, he's the word made flesh. That's the Holy Spirit. That is Yahweh Elohim, made flesh. That's the Holy Spirit. And what enabled him to do everything he was doing was because he was Yahweh Elohim in a body. He was anointed with the spirit. Oh, sorry. That's okay. He was anointed with the spirit to preach. And in Acts, the second chapter, it picks that up. I just wanted to run that quick line just to show that Yahshua was anointed. Who It says that Yahweh anointed Yahshua. If anybody knows where that is. It's Acts, the second chapter. Um... Huh. I can't find it. Is it 22? 22, maybe? Yes. He was approved, a man approved of Yahweh? Oh, no. No. Um, it says that Yahweh anointed Yahshua. I can't find it. I'm sorry. I'll look it up and give it to you next week, okay? Yahweh anointed Yahshua, and that's how he is able to preach his own gospel. That is the creator preaching his own gospel. Now, in order for you and I to preach the gospel, which we must do, in Matthew 24, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world before the end comes. 
Yahshua preached the gospel. And he preached his death, burial, resurrection, according to the scriptures. And 50 days later, Pentecost came. Now, can I have the elementary chart? I have Acts 10 and 38. Go uh, ahead. Go ahead. You can read that. Okay. How Yahshua. Okay. Acts 10 and 38. Thank you. <clears throat> Yahweh anointed Yahshua. Yes. Um, Just get right to word, it. Okay. Okay. Yes. How Yahweh anointed Yahshua of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, and Yahweh was with him. Yahweh was with him. And in Matthew 20, 28, he said, I didn't come to be ministered unto. I came to minister. Mm -hmm. And just like this high priest had to be uh, anointed to minister into that tabernacle, Yahshua, he is the minister of ministers. He's the prophet of prophets. He's the creator himself. And he is anointed with that spirit of Yahweh, those divine attributes of intelligence, wisdom and knowledge, beauty, love, justice, foundation, power and strength, which are broken down by that pattern of principles. That's why we preach these principles. They're a breakdown of Yahweh's divine attributes that make up his divine nature. The will to do good and right and obedient, that's a divine, that's a, a righteous nature. See? Now, um, I wanted to show you in 1 Corinthians 15, we don't have to get it, but the gospel is so important because without the gospel, we wouldn't be able to understand anything about this book. The Catholic Church has the Holy Spirit pictured as a dove. They don't even know what it is. They don't know what the Holy Spirit is. We do. There's only really one Holy Spirit. Yahweh Elohim Yahshua. He's holy. Elohim and Yahshua are two witnesses to point to Yahweh to show you what he feels, what his purpose is. Yahweh so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him, according to the witnesses that he's provided, I added that, shall not perish but have everlasting life. See? Now, we go to the gospel, we see Yahshua die, bury, and resurrect according to the scriptures. We saw it with the children of Israel in a death-like state, and Moses going down there and telling them about the plagues and telling them about Yahweh came to deliver. He told them about Yahweh's name, see, and about the Passover lamb. And Israel passed through, Yahweh caused Moses to open up the Red Sea, and they passed through the tunnel of the Red Sea and resurrected into the wilderness to serve Yahweh. They were following that cloud or let up of the spirit to serve Yahweh like Chuck was bringing out. That's why they were resurrected, just like the priests resurrect to serve Yahweh, just like all the prophets are resurrected, Jonah resurrected to serve Yahweh, Yahshua came in to carry out Yahweh's purpose. He's obedient to the Father. He says in John, the 14th chapter, the last verse, I do my Father's will. I love my Father and I'm obedient. It says something like that. Anyways, the gospel, the death with Adam and Eve, the burial in Satan's kingdom, and the promise of a resurrection through Yahshua the Messiah coming in through childbearing 63 generations later. Death, burial, and resurrection. You've got Noah preaching death to the world unless they hear Yahweh's vision that was given to Noah about the flood. He told them, it's going to rain. The creator told me so. Come repent. Turn from your evil ways and turn to Yahweh and come and get in the ark. So the people, Noah was preaching death. There's a burial in the, in the ark. Noah and the family got in the ark. And there's also a burial in the whole flooding of the whole world and all the people that died in it that didn't receive Yahweh's vision from Noah. See, but you have a death, burial, and a resurrection. 
with those with the righteous one. See, um, Isaac was dead and buried in Abraham's mind. And then the angel stays his hand so he doesn't have to kill him. So he's resurrected in Abraham's mind. Death, burial, resurrection, death, burial, resurrection, death, burial, resurrection, death, burial, resurrection, death on the altar, an innocent sacrifice or a lamb, just like Tara was talking about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. An innocent sacrifice is slain for the sinners so that they might get out of that state of sin and bondage just like the lamb was slain here so that Israel could get out of that sin and bondage. So that's a death of a righteous lamb to get the sinner out of bondage or out of death. And then you've got a burial with the labor. The priest had to be baptized in it and the sacrifices had to be washed in it. Death, burial, and the priest was anointed and he resurrected to serve Yahweh. That's a death, burial, and a resurrection. And that's at the age of 30. And Israel resurrected on the third day. The priest went into his high priest ministry at 30. Uh, uh, Abraham had Isaac resurrected in his mind on the third day. 330, 300, 3000. It's all the same principles. See, um, Noah and the family resurrected three days after the death of Methuselah, who died on May 14th, which, which, is going according to the second Passover in Numbers, the ninth chapter. If you couldn't keep the Passover in April, you kept it in May. Methuselah shows forth that lamb that died in May 14th. He didn't get in the ark and he didn't die in the flood. He wasn't evil. So Yahweh caused him to be like that righteous sacrifice on the 14th. And three days later, Noah and the family were resurrected in that ark. That's a death, burial, and a resurrection. And you have a death, burial, and resurrection with Daniel was considered dead, thrown in the lion's den. And he's buried in the, in the lion of hungry lions, a den of hungry lions. And Yahweh doesn't allow the lions to touch him. And Daniel is of the tribe of Judah, which is the ensign is a lion. Lions don't eat lions. <laughs> Anyways, you have Daniel going through a death, a burial, and Yahweh resurrects him out of there. See, death, burial, and resurrection in the prophets. And Jonah in the, you know, going to preach to Nineveh, and he doesn't go. He goes another way. He disobeys. So Yahweh He's as good as dead when they throw him overboard. He's put in a fish. He's buried in that fish's belly. He, there's, he changes his mind in there. And Yahweh causes him to be spit out or resurrected on the shores of Nineveh to go preach. And you see a difference in Jonah after he gets kicked out of the fish. It's like getting the Holy Spirit. He's now got the right attitude and he goes and preaches to Nineveh and Nineveh is saved because Noah went there. So those are witnesses in the law and in the prophets. To, and Jonah was resurrected on the third day out of that fish. See, and that shows forth Yahshua. Yahshua is called the Lamb of Yahweh. And just like they had to put the four points of blood of the lamb on the doorpost, Yahshua has four points of blood on him. He's called the door. The top of the door you have the blood with the crown of thorns you got two uh he's nailed with a crown of thorns on his head nailed with his two hands and then the two feet with one nail the four points of blood of the lamb and that's showing forth how the lamb died in egypt but i'm not done with that come back for me please shrink it up for me would you i need yashua's baptism Top right. Yep, I'm sorry. Just a minute here. I just messed up. I'm sorry. Just to... That's okay. It's not letting me. Okay. Okay. Top right. Top right. Okay, I got to shrink it. Just a minute. Okay. I'm sorry. Sorry. Don't be sorry. It's okay. These. It's just the devil messing with us. Okay, here's Joshua. He hasn't died yet. But he's on the cross as a lamb. Whoops. Sorry. That's okay. Okay. He's the sentence of death is on him, just like they had to take the lamb out on the tenth and hold it over and examine him. Yahshua the Messiah was taken out of the flock of Israel when he was called the Lamb of Yahweh by John. But he wasn't offered up until almost four years later. 
in a day is a year with the children of Israel. Remember the 40 days that the spies went up to spy out the land and the 10 mm -hmm. spies didn't receive the true report or the 10, there were 10 false reporters and two true reporters and Israel received the false report. And Yahweh said, you got to stay here a year for every day they were over in Canaan's land. So 40 years for 40 days. Mm -hmm. So a year is as a day, okay? So four years later, Yahshua the Messiah is actually offered up. But I want to finish this baptism plate. Yahshua is considered dead. The sentence of death is on him because he's called the lamb. And he's baptized by John to fulfill water baptisms and to fulfill being the lamb in the law and the prophets. And he is, John, the uh, disciple, sees the spirit of Yahweh descending upon him and lighting like a dove. See, that spirit resurrects him into the wilderness. And that's like an anointing too, spirit correlates to the oil and to the Holy Spirit. The cloud correlates to the oil and the Holy Spirit. So Yahshua is anointed and he's resurrected into his ministry. And guess how old he is? 30. Yep. And then you've got blood, water, spirit, or death, burial, resurrection, the witnesses in the earth plane that prove out that Yahshua is the Messiah by going law, prophets, and fulfillment by this pattern. Anyways, we're going to go to Yahshua. Here's his actual death on the cross. In that specially prepared body that took on all of our sins, he was buried in Joseph's new tomb. Why? Because the children of Israel, when, when they went through the Red Sea, they had to take Joseph's bones with them. And that Red Sea opened up like a tomb. And didn't it bury Pharaoh and his host in the end? It was like a tomb. It's a burial. And... um. Joseph's bones had never been at the bottom of that tomb before. Had they? That's Joseph's new tomb, way back there with Moses. Can you believe that? Anyway, so Yahshua's death, buried in Joseph's new tomb. He, he fulfills the Sabbath. He takes away that body that took on all of our sins, and he consumes it in the tomb in the burial and he resurrects a life-giving spirit and many of the sons that slept in the heart of the earth like adam and noah and all the patriarchs that we were talking about they resurrected with him as his body this is a vision to tell us what's going to happen at pentecost yashua was picking up all that are dead before and all that are dead after and we know there's 4,000 years of death and darkness from Adam to Yahshua. But there's, there's 2,000 years of darkness and death in this earth plane. Still, the mystery of iniquity is still at work. But we have Yahshua the Messiah coming in to deliver us from that ignorance and that carnally minded state that we got put in because of Eve being deceived. And actually, when we're born, we're born innocent and we're born without the Holy Spirit. So we're easy pickings for the devil. So what happened to Eve is basically what happens to us. We're born innocent, Satan deceives us, and we end up carnally minded, spiritually dead. Know nothing about our great creator. All we see is the flesh. And that's what the mystery of iniquity wants you to see. See, there are two mysteries. Yahweh Elohim created an opponent. He created a worthy adversary. So that when you get in trouble and when Satan causes you harm, the creator will come and rescue you. Just like he rescued the children of Israel from the mightiest kingdom of the world. Yahweh's name was spread famously throughout the world. Up in Canaan land, they heard about what Yahweh did down in Egypt. His name just spread. Hey, Kath, sorry, forgot to give you the bell. Oh, time's out? Okay. Yeah. And what yeah. I just want to say is, Yahshua within us is the reality of it all. And that was the purpose that Yahweh had in mind is that we'd have his spirit and be his sons and daughters, be his, but he's 
fruitful and multiplied through us mm -hmm. so that we now can give him the glory that he deserves because he has poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. We can't take any credit. We have to give him all the glory for giving us his spirit, giving us eyes to see, and letting us be one with him. Hallelujah. 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 All right, that concludes our Wednesday Zoom. We want to thank all of our um, guests and everybody that's come out to study with us. We hold classes here on Zoom every Wednesday from 7 to 9, every Sunday from 11 to 1 at our location mm -hmm. at 6615 Sheldon Road in Town & Country, Tampa. We have a um, newer location on Friday that um, is going to be emailed out for those that want to make a Friday um, class and uh, look out for that email and um, let's all stand and be dismissed with the doxology taken from the last couple of verses in the book of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua, the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.